chapter 9, verses 18 through 25, C is for commitment. Amen. C is for commitment. That's what I want to talk to us about today. Luke chapter 9, verses 18 through 25, we stand in honor of the reading of God's word this afternoon. And the word of the Lord from the King James text reads, And it came to pass, as he, meaning Jesus, was alone praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom say the people that I am? They answering said, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say that one of the old prophets is risen again. He said unto them, But who say ye that I am? Peter answering said, The Christ of God. And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. <clears throat> for what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? You bow your heads with me one more moment, Father. Once again, God, we love you and we're so grateful for the opportunity right now to be in the house of God. The word of the Lord is that bread that we consume for our nourishment. Lord, your spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost is that which energizes and encourages and lifts us up. Our faith today, God, is dependent upon your word. We need to hear from heaven. You can preach from the Bible and never preach the word of God. And I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me today as your servant and allow me to declare unto the people of God, thus saith the Lord, let me not merely preach some sermon yet, but let me deliver unto the people of God your words, your message for this hour. We need to hear from heaven. Master, in Jesus' name, touch every heart, every hearer. Not Don't just speak to our mind, but speak to our soul today, God. Let us today be so encouraged in our faith by this word that we leave this place, we leave this message with a far greater commitment to the cause of Christ and to the gospel for which you died than we came in with. We ask it all today in that precious name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this afternoon. Praise God. Amen. I'm going to tell you, growing up as a kid in the Pentecostal church, I've heard this passage preached on many, many times. And I'm sure many of you have as well. And if there's anything that I've noticed, if there's anything, you know, sometimes you eat something and you have a lingering aftertaste. If there is any lingering aftertaste when it comes to this particular passage of Scripture, when the Lord said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, Brother Johnny, maybe your experience is different. Brother Bill, maybe your experience is different. I don't know. But every preacher I've ever heard talk about this passage, about denying yourself and taking up your cross. If you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross. Every message I've ever heard talks about 
the sacrifice and the torture and the torment of living for God. Bless God if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to be a child of God, if you're going to live for the Lord, then you better realize it's going to be hard. You better realize it's going to be tough. Jesus carried the cross. He went to Calvary. He was crucified. Oh, and don't you think any different for yourself. Hello now. I tell the truth. I've never heard this message preached. I've never heard this passage preached where it came from a positive perspective. I've never heard it preached where it talked about anything good and cheerful and positive. No, every time they talk about denying yourself and taking up your cross, the message is all about sacrifice. The message is all about torments. The message is about how hard it may be to live for the Lord, but bless God, you've got to live for the Lord anyway. Glory to God. It doesn't matter how tough it gets. It doesn't matter how rough it is. And that is the message I've heard growing up. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me this week as I was contemplating and, and uh, trying to hear from heaven to receive a word. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Here again we have a passage that is all too misunderstood. And yet, if you keep this passage in context. Now, I don't know any preacher on the planet that talks more about context than I do. I'm always talking about not just context in terms of the wording that we read in the passage itself, but in terms of the Word of God as a whole. Because no passage stands alone. No passage says something and is without support or without, you know, some kind of legs under it elsewhere in the Word of God. No, the Word of God says, I, I constantly remind us of this, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That is how God speaks to His people. So you cannot take a passage and just pull it out of context and ignore everything else in the Word of God. No, you've got to find where that piece fits in the puzzle. Well, when you look at the passage that we've read today and you see the Lord's words concerning if any man, I'm going to read it again, verse 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross, but there's a word that's added there, daily and follow me. The Lord spoke to me and said, the cross, that C word that we read in this passage, he said that cross is not talking about an instrument of torture and torment and death. He said, no, that cross represents a mission. That cross represents a purpose. I came to earth for the sake of Calvary. Calvary is why I came. That was the whole purpose in my coming. By the time the cross was laid upon my back, I had to be committed. I had to be committed to the task for which I had come. So that cross, that C word, represents commitment. Are you going to follow through? Or are you going to decide at the last moment, it's too hard, it's too tough, I quit. My God, the Word of God said He could have called 10,000 angels. The Lord had the authority, He had the power to call down from heaven legions of angels to rescue Him from the cross. But he didn't. Why? Why did he not do this? It's simple. He was committed. In order to achieve what 
the plan and purpose of God was for the Lamb of God, he had to go through this experience. And I tell the truth. Amen. He had to go through this. He was committed to doing. Children, I want you to know today, as children of God, we've got to get out of this mindset that God is in heaven for the purpose of serving us. And doing our bidding. Oh, it's all about what God can do for me. No, it's not. Amen. It's all about taking up your cross, denying yourself daily, every day. In other words, you've got to be committed to this thing. Tommy comes home from work sometimes, and he's so burned out and... They've been going through such a hard time with Scott being ill all this time. And they're minus a major player in the workforce at his job. And so much responsibility falls on his shoulder and he comes home sometimes. And, you know, he'll say, you have no idea how close I, I come today to just wanting to quit and just wanting to give up and just wanting to walk away because honestly it gets to be too much gets to be too much. But the next morning, guess what? The alarm goes off. Well, not with Tommy. I was going to say, the alarm goes off, he wakes up and gets up and goes to work. Not with Tommy. The alarm goes off, I push him, shove him, kick him, you know, do everything I can. About 10 or 12 times, he hits the snooze button, 10 or 12 times. Finally, he wakes up and wanders off to work. Why does he do this? Why does he continue, listen, daily to keep getting up, to keep getting under that same burden that he left yesterday and doing the job and continuing? Why does he do it every day, day after day? Because he's committed to the job. Whatever his purpose is, whatever his reasons for being, he may be committed to the job because we have a mortgage to pay, but the idea is he's committed. Do you follow what I'm saying? The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me this week. He said, when I talk about getting under that cross, when I talk about if you're going to be a follower of mine, you've got to take up your cross and you've got to follow me. You've got to take up your cross daily. Daily, and then let me lead. He said, I'm talking about commitment. I'm not talking about crucifixion. I'm talking about commitment. Every day you've got to wake up and have a mind. I'm going to live for God today. Hallelujah. Every day you've got to live for God. Every day you've got to wake up with a commitment. I'm going to do the best I can to be the best I can today. Hello now. You've got to be committed to this thing. We live in a world today where commitment is in short supply. Look at the divorce rate in America. Commitment is in short supply. Look at the relationships of friends and neighbors and family members around you. I've got family members who have been divorced or been married two or three times just in the time Tommy and I have been together. My mother says, I've got three sons and the one that has the strongest relationship and the one that has the most sound relationship, the most committed relationship, is my gay son. <laughs> yep. Well, honey, if that don't tell you something, nothing does. It's about commitment. It doesn't mean everything is rosy. It doesn't mean everything is perfect. Johnny, Bill, I love you both, and I'm sure you're both wonderful, and at home you're just angels with wings, but I'm also sure if, if my name is Charles and if I know anything at all about how the real world works, y'all probably look at each other every once in a while and wish you had a hatchet. <laughs> Lord, he's driving me nuts. Amen. Right? Amen. There are times when you go through negative situations. You go through struggles. There are times when no matter how much you talk, you're not communicating. You're talking, but the other guy ain't hearing you. 
I see the eyes, Bill. <laughs> there are times when you question whether or not you want to wake up the next morning with that fool on the other side of the room looking at you. You say, you know what, I'm not sure. I, I, I might like to wake up tomorrow morning and see an empty bed on the other side because this nut is getting on my nerve these days. But what keeps you in that relationship is not feelings of mushy-gushy love. It's not all this romance and all this perfection and everything going as well as it ought to go. No. What keeps you in that relationship is your commitment. And without fail, commitment has a way. I'll tell you. I tell people who want to get married all the time, if you're not committed to one another, you have no business getting married. Because commitment will carry you when you look across at the other person and you just want to scratch their eyes out. Commitment will carry you when you look at that person and you think to yourself, what in the name of God ever attracted me to you? What was, how drunk was I? Did somebody spike my drink? Did you put a Mickey in my water? What in the world? How in the world did you and I ever get together? And yet, if you're committed to that relationship, you know what happens? Somewhere down the road a little ways, what you couldn't see today, you'll see tomorrow. Today I couldn't remember why I was attracted to that person. Today I can't remember why it was that I fell in love with that person. But you know what? A couple days from now, I'll remember. Amen. I'll remember. My, my head will clear. My thoughts will get right. Right now I've got all kinds of work stuff in my brain. I've got all kinds of life experiences coming on me. I've got all kinds of weight piling down on my head. And it's kind of clouding my vision. But you know what? A couple days from now, when the situation's a little different, like me yesterday, you know, once I put on the camouflage pants and that little khaki shirt, <laughs> honey, if that ain't enough to remind you of what, what made you think I was a hunk of hunk of burning love, then I don't know what is. <laughs> <laughs> Commitment will carry you when you're not feeling it. Commitment will carry you when you've kind of lost sight of your purpose and you've kind of lost sight of understanding why you are where you are. Amen. I remember meeting a couple on an airplane years ago. A lot of people don't realize what a wonderful ministry Jim Baker and PTL used to have many years ago. It's so easy for people online to just criticize and condemn and you know everybody wants to condemn Tammy. She wore too much makeup. She cried too often. You know well I'm going to tell you people that cry a lot like that a lot of times are going through a lot of depression. So instead of judging and criticizing her, you might have had a little bit of compassion on her because honestly, the woman was going through stuff you can't even imagine what she was going through. You ought to buy her book and read her story. You'll understand better what she was under. But Jim and Tammy at PTL over there in North and South Carolina in that area, they had really built up quite an enormous, wonderful, wonderful ministry. And I met people on an airplane years ago, a couple, and they were telling me, we began to talk, and they were telling me, they said, we are Christians, and we were married for many, many, many years, she said, and we got to the point where we were arguing and we were fighting and we were bickering all the time and we looked at each other and my God, we couldn't hardly stomach to look at one another and we spent most of our time in separate rooms and we didn't care about being together anymore. We didn't care about, uh, you know, uh, even to look at each other and said, oh, it was just a terrible situation. She said, we knew, we knew we were headed for divorce. We knew that was the ultimate 
answer, but we were trying so hard to not quite go down that road. And the husband said to me, he said, all of a sudden one day I was watching PTL on television and Jim and Tammy were talking about a, a marriage encounter program that they had at PTL and how it could help your marriage and how it could save your marriage. He said, I looked at my wife and I said, what do you think? Why don't we do this? Why don't we try this? And, and you know what? If this don't work, then we'll just call it quits. She said, okay. She told me, she said, I figured we'd go there for a week and, and we'd wind up calling it quits. Because she said, I could not for the life of me see any, any light. I could not see a light at the end of the tunnel. She said, as far as I was concerned, it was pretty much a done deal. But as Christians, well, we'll give it this one last pitch. We'll give it one last try. He said, we went to that marriage encounter and he said, during the process of the program, said, we began to understand that there were so many other things in our lives that were crowding us and were causing us pain and causing us discomfort and causing us stress. And we felt like we had a thousand things in our lives that were beyond our control. Everything was just running haywire and we had no control. We had nothing going on. Said, and we found that we were looking at one another and we, the only thing in our life we had any semblance of control over was our relationship. Said, even if the control meant calling it quits. At least we were doing that. Because we were in control. You follow what I'm saying? He said, everything just seemed so crazy. He said, well, we began to realize that all these things were crowding in and they were taking precedent over our marriage and over our relationship. He said, long story short, by the end of the week, we had learned to compartmentalize and we had learned to prioritize and we had learned that the things that were really causing us all the grief and all the woe wasn't each other it was all this other stuff and said and we realized that you know what there are some choices we can make there are some decisions we can make there are some priorities we can change so that these things don't affect us the same way he said, my God, we left that marriage encounter. He said, I promise you, we were more in love than the day we got married. All of a sudden, we were looking at each other and we were appreciating one another again. He said, we understood one another. We were communicating. He said, all this trouble in our marriage didn't have a thing in the world to do with our marriage. It had to do with all these other things. But you know what? Those people were committed to one another. Here they were, their marriage was a total shipwreck. It was a total train wreck. But they were still in the same house. They were still trying. They saw this marriage encounter thing on TV, and they didn't just say, hey, it won't work, it, it doesn't matter, it's not going to work. No, they said, well, let's at least give it a try. Do you follow what I'm saying? There was commitment there. These people, and, and they didn't even realize that at the core of their relationship was this commitment. And do you know what happened? That commitment wound up seeing them through the most difficult, horrendous period in their marriage that they would ever experience. I'm going to tell you something, folks. I'm going I'm to tick off a lot of LGBT people and, and oh well, that's, that's my job. That's what I do. That's who I am. I get a little sick and tired. I do. I get sick and tired of hearing LGBT people. Well, bless God, people in the church hurt me, and you just don't know how bad people hurt me, and you just don't know what a horrible experience I had in the church, and, and you don't understand. I don't want anything to do with God. I don't want anything to do with church. I don't want anything to do with being a Christian because you don't understand what people did to me. Um, 
I'm not going to take the time today to tell you my story, but trust me, it was a nightmare on wheels. The things that happened in my life leading up to my coming out and, and living honestly and all that, uh, honey, it was a nightmare of the biggest proportion you could ever imagine. It was an unholy disaster. I had a preacher in a massive Jesus named Mega Church turn his back on me and not want anything to do with me. And I had an entire faith community turn their back on me. I had a family I was staying with kick me out, put me on the street. I wound up in a motel. I wound up literally not having food to eat. I literally went for several days without a single morsel of food in my mouth. I was shaking like this, Johnny, for days because I had no food, nothing to eat. I was alone. I was in Texas. I was in a part of Texas. I had no family. I had no friends. I had nothing. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. My walk with God doesn't have nothing to do with those people. And those people don't have one stinking thing in the world to do with my walk with God. That's right. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, I left church. Oh, yeah, I was hurt. I was bruised. I was wounded. I left the church. I went off on my own. I began to do all kind of things, all kind of ways. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. My faith never left me. Oh, I still believe Jesus was who Jesus is. I still believe Jesus did what Jesus did. I still believe Jesus accomplished what Jesus accomplished. I still believe the Word of God was faithful and true. I still believe God was a miracle working God. I still believe God answered faith. I still believe God saved the sinner. I still believe that God was real. And even in my backslid state, I would go to God in prayer when things got tough. Because I knew where my help lied. And when the opportunity finally came to me to turn my life around and get back into the church and get back into service and get back where I needed to be, living for God and walking with the Lord, I'm going to tell you something. I ran for that altar. I ran for it. Because I'm going to tell you, my love for God and my commitment to Him is so much greater than anything anybody can do me dirty or anybody can do me wrong. If anybody ever experienced negativity and nastiness from people that he considered friends, look at Jesus. The same people who just a couple days ago were shouting, Hosanna! Glory to God in the highest! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord! Now they were standing before the Roman leader and screaming, crucify him, crucify him. Same people. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to follow my example, if you're going to follow my lead, then every day you're going to have to get up under that cross. What is that cross? Is that cross... Living for God is torment. Living for God is nothing but negativity. And that, no, that's not what that cross represents. You've got to get up under that commitment and you've got to carry it another day. You can only do it day by day. You can only do it each time you open your eyes in the morning. You can't, you can't carry over from yesterday into today. You've got to make a fresh decision every morning. Today I'm living for God. Today I'm walking with the Lord. Today I'm going to continue in my faith. Hello now. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through, uh, excuse me, 36 through 39. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. See, the Lord was southern. I'm going to go pray yonder. See, he was southern. I don't know why he didn't say y'all. <laughs> and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. 
tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He was committed to the plan of God. Are you committed to the plan of God for your life? Are you committed to the will of God for your life? Are you carrying the cross of commitment? Or are you busy trying to convince God to follow you and let you lead? Are you leaving that cross there? Because after all, that cross involves being committed to what? To God's plan. When Jesus carried that cross, he was carrying God's plan on his back. It's not what he wanted. He said, if you're able... I'd like this cup to pass from me. Hello now. Oh, it, it, it wasn't what he wanted to do, but it's what he had to do. Why? Because it was the plan of God. Mm -hmm. You see, a lot of us, bless God, if, it's not, if it don't fit in our plans, Tommy, then it ain't going to be done. A lot of us, if it don't fit in our plans, then it ain't going to happen. I'm going to tell you, there are some things I'm doing today that I'm doing because the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me years ago about some stuff that was coming on our world. And people, you can look at me like I'm crazy all you want to. I don't care. Don't bother me no way. Look at me crazy. When the rain comes and I'm the only guy with a boat, <laughs> honey, if you didn't help build the ark, you ain't going to ride in it. Trust me, one, one person that rode on that ark that didn't help build it. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. This little church has been struggling for years. There's a whole lot more people that could take advantage of some of the stuff we're doing if they'd only been here to take advantage of it. But you know what? When all hell breaks loose and our society turns into a chaotic mess and people are shooting one another dead because we've got a, a, a civil war going on, all of a sudden they're going to wish, oh, I wish I'd have been part of a church where... People had made themselves ready for a contingency like this. Well, what a shame you weren't. For years, I tried to warn you. For years, I tried to tell you. For years. Well, I got news for you. Tommy and I went up to that campsite, and we worked our butts off yesterday. And you know what? We didn't get a whole lot of nothing done. <laughs> we didn't get, I mean, honestly, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot, a lot, a lot of work to get everything the way I'd like it to be. But you know what? I'm doing it. Why? Because I'm up under my cross. I'm committed to God's plan for me, not to my plan. My plan would be take it easy, stay in bed, and sleep a while. That'd be my plan. But I know God has spoken to me. I'm following His lead. Not only am I committed, but I'm following Him. Hello now. And wherever He leads, it doesn't matter whether He leads me in a good path. It doesn't matter whether He leads me in a tough path. Whatever path He leads me, that's the path I'm going. Because I know if I'll follow Him, I'll be safe. I know if I follow Him that I'll be cared for. I know if I follow Him that the end is going to be better than the beginning. Am I telling the truth now? Oh, I want to tell you the problem we have today with the concept of commitment is people are committed all right, but they're committed to the wrong things. That cross represented God's plan. The flesh, that flesh that Jesus wore, it didn't want the cross. That flesh that Jesus wore, he just told his disciples in our primary text today that the Son of Man was going to go and he was going to be judged and he was going to be crucified and that he would rise again. So the Lord knew the whole plan. Am I telling the truth? He knew that the end was going to be a good end. Yes. Yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, he still said, if there's any way that we can bypass all this hurt and all this pain and all this emotional torment of being turned on by your friends and those that you have loved and those you care for. Oh, I'm going to tell you, as a pastor, you, let me tell you, you ain't never been turned on by people that you've done nothing but love and try to help. You've never been hurt like a pastor's been hurt. 
If I had a nickel, Tommy's been around for almost 17 years now. He's watched me. There have been people in this church that I have done not a thing in the world but care about them and love them and want to help them. I've gone out of my way. I've rented U-Hauls to get people out of bad relationships. And they've turned around and they have stabbed me in the back. And I mean, God have mercy. They have just torn my entrails out and stomped them on the ground and spit on them. And I mean, they made sure, uh, Bill, they made sure they hurt me every way they possibly could hurt me. Jesus knew that's what was coming. He knew. These same people that yesterday I'm riding in to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, and I'm looking at these faces, and these people are screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna, and the highest blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. And he knew tomorrow they're going to be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. The same people I healed, the same people whose children I raised from the dead, <laughs> the same people that I fed, and they're going to turn on me like a pit of vipers, and they're going to hurt me like I've never been hurt before. I'd really rather not go through this. Your flesh... The Bible tells us, we talked about it Wednesday night in our Bible study, our flesh wars against our spirit. And our spirit wars against our flesh. The Lord's flesh was just doing what flesh does. <laughs> it was saying, you don't want to go through what you're about to go through. You don't want to experience. His flesh was just doing what flesh does. Wasn't doing any more, wasn't doing any less. It was doing what flesh does. Your flesh wants to dictate the path you take. Your flesh wants to tell you to take the easy road. Your flesh wants to tell you to go this way rather than that way. But that cross of commitment, the C word is for commitment. That cross of commitment says no I've got to carry God's plan through for my life, whatever that plan is. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and that they might have it, what? More abundantly. God wants you to have a good life. You know, sometimes to get to the good life, you've got to go through some real garbage. It never ceases to amaze me how we human beings are so foolish as to believe that we know better than God. Johnny, I'm probably the only guy in the world that will understand what I'm about to say. I doubt it, but I, I'm probably. <laughs> I've been in relationships in the past. Oh, I was just smitten. I was so in love. I was so into this person. And boy, when they decided they wanted to go a different route, I was devastated. Oh, oh. Lay me out on the ground. Woe is me. My life is over. Oh, give me the poison. Let me kill myself now. My world is ended. Oh, and I'm, you know, y'all think I'm being melodramatic. I'm not. How many of us have been there? Come on now. You know I'm telling the truth. Especially us queens. We love to be dramatic, you know. <laughs> but you know what? Where I'm at today, I'd have never got here if I hadn't separated from that yesterday. Amen. Oh, I'm telling you, he knows the plan. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. Even in that hour that my flesh was trying to convince me that life wasn't worth living. Because after all, everything wasn't the way I thought it should be. Oh, I, I knew this person was my life mate. I knew this person was there. And you know what? The relationship was a disaster from the word go. Amen. There were so many things I wasn't getting that I should have been getting. There were so many things this person was not 
offering me that I should have been offered. If you're going to have a partner, it ought to be somebody that's going to love you, be committed to you, be faithful to you, help you carry your load, not add to your load. I mean, I was in some horrible relationship, and yet my flesh told me, Bill, that that was the one for me. Bless God. I'm going to tell you, young people, if you ever learn what this preacher is trying to tell you today, if you ever learn what I'm trying to tell you, you have no idea how much better your life would be. If you would just learn to trust God, that person walks out of your life and you're crushed. And I understand you're crushed. But trust me when I tell you, I'm 53 years old come September. Trust me when I tell you. God has better things down the road. Don't you sweat it for a minute. Don't you sweat it for a minute. When the right person gets there, the right person will stay there. When the right person gets there, you ain't even going to have to worry about them not being there tomorrow. Amen. You're going to have that confidence and you're going to have that knowledge and you're going to have that peace and you're going to write, Bill, you know when you wake up tomorrow morning, you know exactly who you're going to be looking at. Yes, sir, Tom Selleck. No, no. Uh, <laughs> Johnny looks a lot like Tom Selleck. Maybe a little bit shorter, but it looks a lot like Tom Selleck. Amen. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? C is for commitment. When Jesus said, take up your cross, he was not talking about crucifixion. Jesus said, the way that I go, you can't go. And the way that I go, you don't know. He said, you cannot follow the same path that I'm walking. You can die on the cross and Bill, it wouldn't save a soul in the world. Tommy, you can die on the cross and it wouldn't even save your own soul. So if you think these preachers get up, oh, if you're going to live for God, you've got to be like Jesus, you've got to crucify, crucify, crucify. Um, no. No, you got to carry through on God's plan. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. Now, God's plan, there are going to be good times, there are going to be bad times. But the Word of God said, all things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to His purpose. So we know that the end is going to be a lot better than the beginning. Right. The later is going to be a whole lot better than the now. So whether you're going through a hard time right now, whether you're going through a trial right now, whether you're being tormented right now, whether you're under a weight that is really, really you're struggling with right now, Honey, hold on. Stay committed to doing what God's called you to do. Stay committed to doing because God has a plan. Things will not always be this heavy. Jesus didn't carry that cross every day of his life. Hello now. No, he carried that cross. Out of 33 and a half years, he carried that cross for probably all of an hour. Hello now. Am I telling the truth? Don't you worry, you just got to stay committed to God's plan. All that cross is part of God's plan. All that cross is part of where God's trying to get you to go. Listen to what the Word of God, I'm almost done. Hebrews 12, 1 through 4. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience, listen, the race that is set before us. You don't pick your own path. If you go to New York City to run in the New York City Marathon, they don't say to you, Johnny, okay, the marathon is 15 miles, now run, we don't care what street you take, we don't care what road you run, as long as you run 15 miles, it's all good. No, 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 no. Everybody in that race got to run the same identical path. Am I telling the truth? Everybody in that race got to take the same roads. Everybody's got to climb the same mountains. Everybody's got to go down the same hills. Everybody's got to jump over the same ditches. Everybody's got to climb through the same trees. Am I telling the truth? So we're to run with patience. That means that you have the sense 
to wait. Well, I'm not crazy about where I'm at today. I'm not wild about the way things are today. But I'm going to wait on God because I know He's got a plan. And I know that in spite of the fact today is a tough day. Ooh, I'm preaching to the preacher today. Ooh, I just felt the Holy Ghost. That means God's talking to the preacher today. He said, I've got a plan. Today's not an easy day. But there's a brighter tomorrow coming. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, in, in Hebrews, let's continue. Hebrews 1, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Listen. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He knew there was a better tomorrow coming, Booby. He knew today was hard, but tomorrow was happy. <laughs> he knew that that cross represented God's plan. Mm -hmm. And he knew that part of God's plan was a happy tomorrow. He knew that part of God's plan was victory tomorrow. He knew that part of God's plan was resurrection tomorrow. He knew that part of God's plan was the saints of God who had died before Messiah came were going to be released from the belly of hell and have entrance to heaven all because he stuck with the plan. Because he was committed to the cross. He was willing to follow through and be committed to the plan of God. And the it was too big a payday coming tomorrow for him to refuse to be committed today. Amen. I'm going to tell you, I, I hope you all forgive me, but I grew up in Pentecost. I, I grew up in the church. You don't hear preaching like this in most churches today. Most churches today, every, all the preacher wants to talk about is what God wants to do for you. Oh, how God wants to bless you. How, how every day is supposed to be a good day. How all your life is supposed to be filled with blessing and favor and prosperity and all the good things. They don't talk to you about the need for commitment. And you know what? That's why we're seeing more backsliders in the church today than we've ever seen before. Because they've not been taught commitment. They've not been encouraged to be committed. And therefore, when things get tough, they drop off. Mm -hmm. Continue in Hebrews 12. Uh, finishing verse 2. Listen. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know what a throne is? It's a piece of furniture. Right. What, what this is telling us is he won. And he now, as a human being, he now sits as a victor right next to God. Guess where you and I are going to be when all this is over? We're going to sit as victors right next to God. Hallelujah. We're going to sit in the presence of God. We're going to join the four and twenty elders around the throne. Glory to God. Say, blessed be the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. Verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Nobody in this world ever was mistreated and abused by people that he loved and cared about more than Jesus. Look at how people contradicted themselves in their behavior. They loved him one minute, they hated him the next. Consider him who in, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So what Paul is saying, Jesus went to the point of death. He went to blood. He said, you're just trying to live for God. You're nowhere near where, where Jesus went to. You're nowhere near having to give your life up for this thing at this point. 
Come on, folks. You can't be committed to living for God. And, oh, but this person said this. Oh, this church did that. Oh, they tried to cast demons out of me. Uh, honey, you have yet resisted on the blood. Striving against sin. Striving against sin. What does that mean? Well, let's go. That means, well, you know, you're, you're trying so hard to live holy. You're trying so hard to live. No, 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 no. No. That means sin is fighting you. It is trying to defeat you. It's trying to beat you down. What those people did was sin. The way those people acted was sinful. There was nothing godly. There was nothing truthful. There was nothing Christian about the way those people acted. There was nothing godly. There was nothing Christian about the way the church behaved. It was sinful. But you have not yet resisted on the blood striving against sin. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Their sin against you, their attempts to bring you down and to destroy you. Honey, it didn't bring you to the point where you're bleeding to death. It didn't bring you to the point where you're about to lose your life. Come on now. Get under that cross. Get under that commitment and keep carrying. God has a plan. God has a purpose. The thing you're going through today is nothing compared to what God has in store for you tomorrow. I'm so glad I passed on this. I'm not going to name names. I'm so glad I passed on this one 25 years ago. I'm so glad I passed on this one 20 years ago. I'm so glad I, that this one decided to dump me 18 years ago because I'm happy with where I'm at today. I love somebody and somebody loves me. I get support. I get encouragement. I get things from my booby that I never in a million years got from those people. And yet I wanted to believe that they were the end all and be all. Will you understand? Good Amen. Lord. And you know what I'm talking about. Amen, I do. Glory to God. If you live long enough, you understand what I'm talking about. Amen. <laughs> Taking up your cross is about following through on our commitment to our faith in a risen Christ. It is not a life of torment and torture, but a life more abundant. The cross simply today means walking a path that has been set before us by God and not one that is determined and established by our own flesh and our own will. Cross starts with a C and that C is for commitment. Amen. We sing the old song. If you'll stand with me today.